this was the only slide left from the previous talk. So this this is the one you've gotten today. I just want to finish this from the previous lecture. We were talking about autonomic nervous system. And we described the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation of the intestinal tract. But work in the last decade, especially on the innervation of the intestinal tract, has uncovered some surprises. There's more than just parasympathetic innervation of postganglionic neurons that release acetylcholine and increase peristalsis. There's, in fact, interconnected neurons that basically function as a, a nervous system that's modulated by inputs from the brain, but uh, it amounts to a little nervous system in itself uh, with synaptic connections, interconnections. There may be as and this is an estimate that there may be as many neurons in the enteric nervous system as in the whole spinal cord. I, know, I don't know how those counts have been made. I've not checked that. But anyway, in the wall of the intestine, you have these plexuses of fibers and neurons interconnected. They are innervated by the vagus nerve in the way we describe for autonomic nervous system, but they, they also have their own activity and they, they get their own inputs. They can function without the nervous system, without the brain, without the central nervous system. Okay. It's also been discovered that something similar is true for the cardiac ganglion. Okay, there are interconnections. There are, you're basically, there's a possibility that your heart has a little brain. All right. So that's still an area of active investigation. There are neuro various neurotransmitters involved, not only acetylcholine in that system. OK, we have this lecture and the next time still devoted to a survey of sort of an introduction to a neuroanatomy of the various parts of the nervous system. We're going to talk about the brain. Now, we've talked about the spinal cord and the autonomic nervous system. Today, we'll talk about hindbrain. Uh, we may get to some of the midbrain, but we'll do that next time, where we will discuss the forebrain, and then we will talk about development. OK, so here's our picture of the embryonic mammalian nervous system with the expanded neural tube the expanded hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain with the endbrain bulging out from the forebrain. Today we'll talk first about this level, the hindbrain, which looks this way in cross-section. We'll see that its basic organization is very similar to the spinal cord, so I call it a glamorized spinal cord. We'll go over its basic functions and cell groupings. Then we'll talk about the sensory channels for the sensory input from the face that comes directly into the hindbrain through the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve. And then I'm going to talk about some distortions in the basic organization that happen with the growth of cerebellum and primarily. We saw some of the distortions in the hindbrain that happen with the development of certain sensory systems in fish. So now we'll see what the distortions are in, in, in the human brain. OK, so the embryonic spinal cord and hindbrain have a very close relationship. We, this is the spinal cord, the neural tube at the spinal level. We talked about the alar and basal plates. Uh, in early development, you have a layer of cells around the ventricle, ventricle, and that's where cells are born. We're going to be talking about development and the mitoses that happen there and the process of migration from the ventricular zone. Intermediate zone in the 
is where the cells then end up. They migrate into that region and then the very outer layer we call the marginal zone has mainly fibers. Okay. Now you have the same organization, the embryonic hindbrain. Okay. But there's a difference in that the roof plate, which is just very similar to the floor plate in the spinal level, in the hindbrain level, the roof plate expands. It's like you just pull this open. So what happens then is that the iter plate ends up more lateral, the basal plate more medial. Otherwise, it's a similar organization. The secondary sensory cells, though, become more clumped together than in the spinal cord. So we end up with different cell groups, or we often call them nuclei like the cochlear nuclei representing getting the auditory input from the primary sensory neurons of the, in the cochlea. So they form in the alar plate and similarly in the basal plate you have groupings of motor neurons. Uh, you have those in the spinal cord but they don't form these compact nuclei the way they do in the hindbrain. In the spinal cord, we, we know there was a dorsal root and a ventral root at each segment of the cord. What about the hindbrain? Well, there are inputs and outputs there too, but the law of roots doesn't hold anymore. There are some nerves that are just like ventral roots, that are some like the auditory nerve that are just like dorsal roots, but there are other mixed nerves. In fact, some of them penetrate right through the side here. So let's go over this a little more. This is what I just said. Now let's go through the functions a little bit and then we'll come back to the anatomy. Mostly we think of hindbrain in terms of what I call the routine maintenance functions, the janitorial service area of the central nervous system, vital functions, control of breathing blood pressure, heart rate, other visceral control. Remember, the main um, CNS cell groups of the parasympathetic nervous system are in the hindbrain. We know that many fixed action patterns are organized and controlled by organized neural circuitry in the hindbrain. Uh, our smiling is a fixed action pattern. Humans that would be controlled by not just the motor neuron organization, but the inner neurons that connect to them and basically form a program of control. So when it's triggered by some adequate stimulus, uh, then you get the action pattern. What other action patterns would you have in hindbrain? Well, our facial muscles are controlled from there. Uh, one would be, uh, and we'll see the circuit for it when we see, uh, in a later diagram, for the eye blink. You say, but that's just a reflex. But actually it isn't. It's also a fixed action pattern because it has a motivational component. The longer you go without blinking your eyes, the more you have a tendency to blink your eyes. You develop a stronger and stronger motivation. That's what staring contests are all about. You see how long you can keep from blinking your eyes. It's harder and harder to stop it, which is typical of fixed action patterns. Okay. When they don't get executed, there's some, a kind of something builds up and, and excitation builds up in the nervous system and makes the probability of their execution more and more likely. Okay. The hindbrain is important in higher functions, not it can't do these things by itself. But in fact, on the output side for speech, our tongue, our lip, tongue control, lip control, and breath control is done through the, primarily through the hindbrain. And that's so critical for speech. Our emotional displays, obviously very important in higher social activity, um, for our facial expressions at least, that's controlled through the hindbrain. And of course, Part of that is eye movement control, which is very important for a number of things, and our orienting movements um, also is controlled by the hindbrain. 
and also by, also by the midbrain. Okay. So now it gets a little complex. I don't expect you to memorize all this, at least not at this point, although after you, you study nervous system for a long time, this becomes sort of automatic. But now I remember we talked about the groupings in the alar plate and the groupings in the basal plate. So let's just see what these groupings are. So here would be the position of the cochlear nucleus. Similarly, it would be the position of the vestibular nuclei. So input comes in through a nerve, a cranial nerve, that's just like a dorsal root, okay? And the secondary sensory cells that receive that input from the primary sensory neurons in the cochlea are located in that position of the hindbrain. Now, they're not all the way up and down the hindbrain. They're just at one level. Okay. But similarly, the input from the face comes in, contacts sec sensory, secondary sensory neurons, located in a different position. Okay, and we, that's the trigeminal nerve, and I'm going to go over that in more detail in a minute. In addition, there are secondary sensory cells of the visceral system, visceral sensory. Okay, so those would be the main three groupings of secondary sensory cells in the hindbrain. And then among the motor neurons, we have motor neurons innervating muscles in the face. For example, swallowing and vocalization is controlled by a group of motor neurons in this level. More rostrally, we have motor neurons related to control of the jaw. And uh, also control of all of our facial muscles, the facial nucleus. Facial nucleus is cranial nerve 7. Uh, chewing movements are part of cranial nerve 5 whereas the swallowing and vocalization depends on control of the tongue, ninth and tenth cranial nerves, and the uh, twelve in addition. Somatic motor column located right here, and this group of neurons, the motor neurons, has output very similar to a ventral root. They always go out uh, about in the same position that the ventral root would be in the spinal cord. And that's how the neurons controlling our eye movements. There's three different cell groups that do that, two in the midbrain, one in the hindbrain. And also the control of tongue movements, the caudalmost cranial nerve nucleus. Okay, so those are the secondary, the motor neurons and secondary sensory cells. And then in addition, whenever you look at brainstem, you're seeing a lot of axons going through. So the axons that we talked about before, what would we, what did we talk about before? We talked about spinothalamic tract, and we talked about the medial lemniscus. So here they are. Here's the spinothalamic tract, position of spinothalamic tract, and over at the medial side there, the medial lemniscus. That's the way they travel through the hindbrain in that position. And then we have various descending tracks as well, okay? And I've indicated those here. Let's just look at this one. Big group of neurons here, uh, axons here at the base. It's much larger in primates as the corticospinal fibers. It's called a synonym for the corticospinal tract in the hindbrain is the pyramidal tract, and it's because of the sort of pyramidal shape of the cross-section there of the corticospinal fibers. Okay, so let's talk about the sensory channels in the hindbrain by talking now in more detail about the trigeminal nerve. I'm sorry the next picture is a little small in your handout, but it is on the web. Uh, look at the figure and let's follow the pathway for the eye blank. Now here's the somewhat enlarged view there of the hindbrain, of the brain, of the uh, upper part of the brain, the nervous system, and here's the hindbrain showing some of these uh, motor neuron groups medially and the secondary sensory cells laterally. But look first at this cross section, okay? Here's the fifth nerve uh, nucleus. Input comes in 
uh, you see there, and joins a little track on the side and goes up and down the hindbrain and terminates in that nucleus at various levels. Okay. Now that input, if we look over here, you can see how it comes in. Here's the trigeminal ganglion coming from the face. Now you can see why it's called trigeminal because there are three main branches that go to different parts of the face. Okay, one branch goes from the upper eyelid up to the beginning of the spinal con uh, input, which is in the back of your head. Okay, and then that's the uh, the first of the three branches, and then there's a the middle branch. Okay, the maxillary branch that innervates uh, the upper lip, and then the lower branch, the mandibular branch. Okay, the lower part of the the lower lip, the jaw, and part of the neck. Okay, so that's the dis distribution of the of the trigeminal nerve. And the ner these are primary sensory neurons. They're just like dorsal. This is just like a dorsal root ganglion, but it's at the in the head. It sits right under the brain. Okay. So if you if you are dis doing a brain dissection of say the sheep brain in a class, you know, and you you will find that right. Basically, it's when they lift the brain up, there it sits, and sometimes they get it. Usually, they end up cutting it about here. Okay. But it's possible to get it in brain removal. So here come the axons. They penetrate right into the rostral the side of the rostral part of the hindbrain. And they terminate in the principal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, but some of them terminate further down because that nucleus has a descending component that goes all the way down, in fact, into the upper part of the spinal cord. So that's why that's so elongated. Okay. So if we take a cross section right there, we're going through the secondary sensory cells, and that's what I show here. Okay. And there are reflex connections from, there's a reflex pathway from those cells that by way of interneurons go into the, this motor nucleus, the facial nerve, the facial motor nucleus, which has axons that take this peculiar looping route and then go out the side and to innervate the facial muscles. And some of those would go to the eyelids, so you could get reflex contraction of the eyelid. That's just eye blink as a reflex triggered by sensory input. Okay. And it will be triggered that way, but then in addition, it gets endogenous input, so we blink spontaneously. Okay, so that's the local reflex channel, just one example of it. Uh, let's now look at the uh, lemniscal pathways. And here, they're very much like the spinothalamic tract and the dorsal column medial meniscus systems. Okay, and they go up to that same nucleus in the thalamus at the spinothalamic tract and the medial meniscus where the, those two tracts from the spinal cord terminate. But they go to the more medial part Ventra the ventral posteromedial nucleus. We generally wrote that in Latin and the abbreviations that you'll find in any textbook are always given this way, VPM, okay, because it's from the Latin nucleus ventralis poster, posterior medialis. Okay. The ventral posterior, the medial part of the ventral posterior nucleus. In this class, we can just call it the whole thing, the ventral basal nucleus. Uh, because it's positioned ventrally and basally in the thalamus. But remember, the sensory part is the caudal, the posterior part of that nucleus. Now let's look at it in this picture. We have to start with the secondary sensory neurons and the trigeminal nucleus, and we see where their axons go.
I talked about the ones that form reflex pathways, but now what about the lemniscal pathways? So we see some here in the principal nucleus that simply send their axon across the midline and ascend right up to the ventral basal nucleus, okay, just like spinal thalamic tract. Okay. They also arise in the descending nucleus at various levels, where again, the, secondary the axon of the secondary sensory cell crosses over and ascends. So this forms then what we call, often call the trigeminal lemniscus. Okay. And we think of the axons arising in the rostral part as being more like the dorsal column system, whereas those in the descending nucleus more like the spinal thalamic tract because of the functions of those axons. But you can think of it as a single pathway that originates at all levels of the trigeminal nucleus and ascends to the ventral basal nucleus. There are branches, just like for spinal thalamic tract, there's some branches that terminate along the way, especially in the midbrain tectum. I do show a few other things on this. I show, for example, the uh, several motor nuclei, including salivatory nuclei. I show both the uh, masticatory nucleus and the facial motor nucleus here in the hindbrain. And I show this little nucleus that's very long that controls uh, swallowing and vocalization. It also gets input from the trigeminal system. All right. Now I showed this basic plan of the hindbrain. Here. And now I want to talk about what happens, why in the adult, especially the human, but it's true for other uh, primates especially, it's very hard to recognize that in a cross-section, especially in the rostral part of the hindbrain. Because that basic embryonic organization becomes very distorted. Remember other species that have different kinds of distortions. The, we saw the picture of the freshwater buffalo fish with a huge vagal lobe. Uh, similarly, the catfish with vagal and facial lobes, which were expanded. We know that the cerebellum in electric fish is enormous. It's very specialized for electro. It's it has a role in the electroreception. Well, in mammals, especially in humans, the cerebellum is also very large because of its role in motor coordination, especially the coordination of the most distal muscles control of our hands and feet. In addition to the cerebellum itself, there are cell groups that pro provide input to the cerebellum. We call them the pre-cerebellar cell groups. Um, for example, the so-called pontine gray. So let's uh, just take a look at one of these, at a cross-section of the human hindbrain. This is from the rostral hindbrain. Now, a caudal hindbrain would not look so different from my diagrams. But if we saw this entire section here, here would be the ventricle. This is, it would be about this big. Okay, they've cut it there so they can see, you can see the core of the hindbrain. Now, what I've been diagramming is basically here, below the ventricle. But this, this is the, a huge structure that's appeared with the development of this enormous cerebellum in humans. Okay, so we can think of that as a distortion. It's much smaller in other mammals, so it's easier to recognize the hindbrain organization in the adult. Even in human, if you look very early in development, you see that the plan that I was outlining very clearly is the cerebellum then develops late and distorts it. So here's the ventricle. This would be the ailer plate region. And there are secondary sensory cell groups in here. 
There are motor neurons here. In fact, here you see some myelinated axons, of one of the, some of those motor neurons. But then what has happened here is that you have movement of cells from the Ehler plate region that have migrated down. Okay, and these are cells that receive connections from various parts of the brain, but especially from the neocortex, and they send their axon up to the cerebellum. In addition, you have huge bundles of axons passing through that region. These are the corticospinal axons, okay, which in human are very, very numerous. They form, just caudal to this, they form the pyramidal tract at the base of the hindbrain. Okay, if we look at this picture, this is where the cerebellum, oh my, <laughs> I drew it in the wrong place, I'm sorry. It must have been under the influence of that champagne for Rutledge's thesis defense. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I can see it immediately here. These, just take your pen and, and move them right down there. I put them in the midbrain. <laughs> they go in the rostral part of the hindbrain. Sorry. <laughs> I will change that um, after the class. <laughs> okay. So I've shown, I, see, I've drawn this without the cerebellum so that you can see the basic plan more readily. I just want you to know that in the rostral part of the hindbrain, in the Ehler plate region, there you have this enormous proliferation of cells in development. They migrate up to the roof plate and form the cerebellum. They migrate also down and form the pontine gray and also other cell groups. I'm not going to name them all. It gets too confusing at this point. And it, it distorts the basic organization, but once you know and you, if you follow it in early development, it doesn't become, it's, you can see this basic plan. The more caudal part of the hindbrain remains pretty similar to this, except you have huge numbers of uh, pyramidal tract fibers, the corticospinal tract fibers at the base there, which will distort that somewhat, but it's much easier to see the basic organization. And of course, the spinal cord that looks like this early on, it changes too, because the ventric, it's the walls of the neural tube get thicker and thicker, and it basically balloons out like this, okay? So you end up with a little ventricle in the middle with a big spinal cord around it. Okay. But it's a little easier to understand than what happens in the hindbrain. Okay. I know we're almost through. I just introduced here the midbrain. Uh, I want you to go look at those pictures. I know when you first get this kind of anatomy, it can be very confusing, you know. And the only way to rescue yourself is basically go over it a number of times. I will go over it in class uh, in different ways when we talk about different functions. Okay, and it sort of grows on you until finally it, you don't have so much trouble with it. The midbrain will be a little easier to deal with. Again, we have the ventricle. Again, we have thickened walls of the neural tube. But the way it develops is quite different. It's an important area of correlation centers, especially the the colliculi that get auditory and visual inputs. There's also particular long axon output systems that originate there. I'm going to just show a couple of those and show you what happens in different species to change the whole shape of the midbrain. And just like we had for the hindbrain, we have to deal with these long tracks <laughs> passing through. Okay. This is just summarizing these so-called correlation centers. The colliculus, which we'll refer to various times in the course. Uh, in the class, it's best known for its visual inputs that come into the surface layers, but it also gets auditory and somatosensory input. It's important in these functions of orientation and antipredator responses. And it gets major modulating inputs from the forebrain as well as well as from some of the more diffusely projecting axons. Inferior colliculus is similar. It's more related to the auditory system. Both of these structures 
send accents forward into the thalamus. It's a major relay for sensory information to the thalamus for both visual and auditory. Uh, even though both of those systems also have more direct accents that bypass uh, the midbrain uh, on the way into the thalamus. And then we'll talk more about these, the multimodal regions, the more primitive parts of the midbrain, reticular formation and central gray, and then the, uh, this output system for sensory motor control of the limbs. Uh, This is the one we'll end with. I'm just showing this basic outline of the, of the midbrain in an adult uh, rodent. The human would be similar, except the axons here would be much, much larger. It would be mainly at quantitative differences in species. Okay. I'm showing here where the fibers are coming in from the retina. Here's an auditory pathway coming from the more caudally located part of the midbrain. And here we see our axons coming through, the medial lemniscus fibers and spinothalamic tract. They form a band coming through the midbrain, and the spinothalamic tract fibers, some of them terminate right in the deeper parts of the tectum there. On the output side, we have two major pathways that originate in the midbrain. One is in the tectum, controlling head and eye movements, where large neurons in the deeper part of that structure send axons as most systems do across the midline, and then they descend to the hindbrain primarily, also the upper spinal cord. But there's also neurons that this is controlling head and eye movements. There are also neurons here concerned with uh, limb control. Okay. This is the so-called red nucleus because of the pig red pigment there in the human brain. Again, the axons are sent across the midline where they then descend in a more lateral position in the tectospinal fibers. Notice I've only underlined those two for you on this. That's what I want that to begin to stick in your mind. I know you won't memorize it right away, but we'll talk about that later when we talk about motor control. Two out motor output pathways that originate in the tectum. All right, so that's where we'll start next time.